right. That's the right. That's the right spirit. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Carol Mason. I'm the president of John Jay, and I'm excited about this event. And I have a notebook ready here to take notes because we're here to learn. Um, and I know that that um, we are in challenging times, but but this is something we all need to hear. And I first met Professor Lachem uh, in 2022 in April at the Truman Institute in Israel. And he talked about his work about hope in the midst of conflict. And we were actually with a whole group of people. And I don't tell them this, but I was all like, can you all just let me talk to him? <laughs> because one of the things I was fascinated by, and many of you have heard me quote him, I give you attribution. Um, and say that he, he always says that, that when people protest, that means they still have hope. And that really, really landed with me. <clears throat> and I work in a community where our students have lots of hope. Lots of hope, because they protest me on a regular basis, don't you? <laughs> so they have lots and lots of hope. Um, but I thought that, that, that when I first um, met him and said we have to ca have this relationship when he comes to the States, is because it, it relates not just to the time we're in right now, but there's so many things happening in this country. And I thought about the work in terms of the, our communities that are challenged by violence. And I thought about the George Floyd time period. I thought about how people reacted to so many challenging things we're dealing with here, the affirmative action decision, the, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, about how do we navigate through spaces when, when they're challenging, but we ought to still be hopeful. And so tonight's event is sponsored by the Office for the Advancement of Research. She's outside checking you all in, but let's give them a thanks. Um, our Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And there they go. <laughs> and she can't be here, and we decided not to, to live stream it, but let's give her thanks because she'll watch it later. Our Office of External Affairs, led by uh, Mindy Boxstein. So Mindy, thank you. Um, and it features, tonight's talk will feature Dr. Odette Lachem, a political psychologist. I'd never met a political psychologist before. And I want to acknowledge our students, faculty, and staff in attendance. Give yourselves a round of applause. And many special friends of the college, including Jules and Lynn Kroll and Shari Aronson. So thank you all for coming to join us tonight. You can clap for them, too. Um, so I want to thank him for sharing, for, for uh, I, I call him Oded, but I'll call you Dr. Lachem. No, Oded is fine. Um, for sharing his time, scholarships, and, and, and insights with us during a time that is likely very difficult for him and his family um, and the communities he serves. In addition to being a political psychologist, Dr. Lachem is also a human rights and peace activist who has worked closely with Israeli and Palestinian communities to address cycles of hopelessness and violence well before the time period we're in today. Today, Dr. Lachem will discuss his new book, Hope Amidst Conflict, and we've been waiting for this book to come out. It's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, so um, he's here to talk about his book and his research on hope, um, in the, and will talk to us about hope in the current conflict of suffering in Israel and Palestine. Um, he teaches and conducts research at the Hebrew University where he serves as a scholar, excuse me, senior research associate at the Psychology of Intergroup Conflict and Conciliation Lab. He's also a research fellow at the Truman Institute where I met him, Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace, and he's a visiting scholar, very timely, at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. So he comes with quite a, quite a um, set of validation of why people want to hear from him. Um, many of the things, as I mentioned, that he shared with me last year was how um, the importance of, of the pitfalls of hope as an essential element for resolving seemingly intractable conflict, but still maintaining that hope. Um, in particular, he talked about the importance of protest, as I mentioned, as evidence that people and communities still believe in the possibility of progress and change. Now, while I said to our students that protest is a sign of that you still believe in hope, you can temper that. I will still believe in your hope without, without all the protests. We can just have conversations like we will today. 
Um, and this is why I'm so glad that he's here to join us today. Uh, this evening, Dr. Lachem will offer the highlights from his book and his work, which combines the wisdom of philosophy, psychology, political science, cultural studies, and theology. And the conversation tonight, um, the, the Q&A will be moderated by our own scholar, <laughs> or, uh, Steve. Steve, Dr. Stephen Russell, who is an Old Testament scholar um, and understands the power of theology. And so these powers, that he's integrating this with quantitative inner inquiry and statistical modeling to talk about how we measure hope in a variety of contexts. Um, he will highlight that hope is relevant to all of us, especially in times of adversity, uncertainty, hardship, crisis, and failure. And his research will help us better understand that hope shines brightest when it's most challenged. So we need some hope tonight. Oh, dead. Um, so as we experience the exceptional powers of hope and resilience, processing these traits um, influences our abilities to cope and respond in stressful times. Now, the beauty of being, having this at John Jay is that we're a community where we want to learn how to use the educational setting to figure out how do we move forward through these times of crisis and not, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, accept despair as our only remedy. Um, I am an eternal optimist, as those of you who know me know, and I believe that, that, that with the young people we're educating today and your presence here in this room, and anybody who knows what a, what's written, it's, this is not on the paper, I believe in our students, and I believe in your capacity to, to use these moments when you're greatly stressed to learn and figure out how we're gonna navigate in the world because many of us in my generation are counting on you all to figure out how to do this right. And I know that with the education that you're getting here at John Jay and with this opportunity to have this important dialogue, when you're most challenged is when you're also gonna develop that muscle that helps you develop, helps you navigate through challenging times. So thank you for showing up because the biggest part is showing up tonight for this conversation. Thank you for giving Dr. Lashem an opportunity to talk to us, and then he will engage with us under the moderation of Dr. Stephen Russell. So thank you all very much for being here tonight. So, um I'm very honored and feel very privileged to be here tonight speaking to this lovely audience. Thanks for uh, 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 President Mason and uh, all the uh, John Jay uh, staff and faculty who invited me. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a political psychologist, which means political psychology is um, some sort of hybrid between social psychology and political science. And what we try to do is to understand political phenomena through, and through the exploration of uh, its um, psychological origins, right? So uh, we try to understand people's beliefs, attitudes, perceptions, emotions, and how that influences political phenomena and political processes. And what I focus on is the political phenomena of violent conflicts, which is not, you know, not something that is very pleasant to, to research, but this is something that is very close to me as someone that is living, uh, I was born and raised in Jerusalem, I live now in Tel Aviv, so I was born in a conflict zone. And so what I try to understand is what motivates people, what are the beliefs, perceptions, and emotions that motivate people uh, to engage in conflict and of course, to engage in peace and reconciliation. And uh, I've been fascinated by this concept of hope for about a decade. And the more I investigate hope, and the more I try to understand really this, because it's a very elusive kind of construct, both in terms of the, its psychological structure, but also in terms of its philosophical meaning. And the more I study hope, the more I'm fascinated uh, with it. Um, and so today I will speak to you as a conflict scholar and as a political psychologist, as a hope scholar, but also as a resident of the, of, uh, the region. 
uh, that is experiencing this, uh, you know, this current violent, uh, violent um, escalation since uh, October 7th, but also as a peace activist and a human rights activist that was, has been working and still working on peace and reconciliation in Israel-Palestine. So I'll also give you some uh, perspectives from that. And to be honest, we uh, planned this event in the summer, way before you know, anyone knew that these tragic um, um, developments in the region will, will start. And people asked me, are you still going on the book tour? Are you still going to talk about hope while people are dying, while people are burying their loved ones? And through my explorations and study of hope, I actually know that hope matters most in the darkest and bleakest situations. When everything's nice and fine and dandy, hope is not very significant. But in challenging times, when we think that everything is kind of falling apart, then hope becomes really significant. And uh, an example I give is like, um, if you think about hope as a small uh, flame of a candle, so the candle's light is not significant if the room is well lit, right? If there is strong daylight and I have a small candle, the light from this candle is insignificant. But if the room is dark, then this light becomes actually significant and meaningful. The darker the room, the more significant this flame. And hope functions and operates in a similar way. Uh, but I also understood that I don't only want to talk about the book, I also need to talk about the current developments in the region, both because for me it's very important to try to make sense of what's happening now, uh, not from the prism of uh, pro-Israeli, not from the prism of pro-Palestine, but from the prism of political psychology, conflict, resolution, trying to understand what is really going on. So I'll devote about 15 or 20 minutes to explain a little bit about uh, the developments in the region and also the ripple effects we see around the world. Here in the US, in New York, in other places in, in Europe, etc. Um, and then I'll talk about the book and we'll refer back and we'll talk about uh, the book and the current developments um, and what I think is that if you have um, uh, really just a clarification questions, I don't mind answering while we're uh, while during the presentation, but afterwards most of the substantial talk we'll do, we'll do afterwards um, in the Q&A session. So first of all, we are probably witnessing the worst or one of the worst episodes in the history of the conflict. We're talking about a very, very long conflict with many violent episodes. So this is probably one of the most tragic events. Uh, just a little bit in terms of geography. So this is the Gaza Strip. Uh, in the Gaza Strip live 2.4 million people. This is one of the most densely populated places in the world, second only to Hong Kong and Singapore and Monaco, and of course you could understand the, that situation of living is not like Hong Kong and Singapore and Monaco, right, in Gaza Strip. And, and two-thirds of the, the Palestinian population in Gaza are descendants of refugees from 1948, so people who fled or were expelled, depending on the narrative you adopt, in 1948 from this region into the Gaza Strip, and third, a third of the population are original residents of the Gaza area. And uh, until 1967, this was Egyptian territory. Okay, so the Gaza Strip was part of Egypt. This is the border with Egypt. This is the Sinai Peninsula that goes way down uh, southwest, and this is uh, Israel proper. And so until 1967, this was Egyptian territory, but in the, in the war of, it's called the Six Day War, the war in June 1967, Israel conquered the Gaza Strip with the West Bank and maintained uh, military control over the people and uh, this land since 1967. After several years, um, Israeli um, civilians started to settle in uh, various areas in the Gaza Strip. So there were also Jewish Israeli settlers in the Gaza Strip. And, but in 2005, there was a decision by the Israeli government, it's called a disengagement from Gaza, to disengage and pull out 
all the civilians and the military troops from the Gaza Strip. This is 2005. And so since 2005, there's no civilian or military presence uh, of, is of Israel within the Gaza Strip. But uh, a year after the disengagement, the Hamas um, uh, uh, took over, actually two years after in 2007. And since then, since 2007, Hamas is actually ruling and governing the Gazians in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, which is here, the, um, the Fatah is the main um, political power. Um, and so uh, when that happened, Israel as a reaction uh, started to uh, make like a siege uh, circling the Gaza Strip, both on land and in sea. And the civilians in Gaza live under this siege from 2007. So we're talking about 16 years with hardly any possibility of going out of the street. This is very, very rare for uh, Gazian uh, citizens to be able to cross, to cross the border, either to Egypt or outside or, or anywhere, actually. And also, since the disengagement uh, and since the Hamas uh, took over uh, Gaza Strip, there's also been violent confrontations uh, maybe once every once a year or two years, it, it, it depends. There are violent confrontations where uh, missiles from Gaza are, um, uh, are fired from the strip into uh, the Israel territory. And Israel is um, uh, bombing the Gaza Strip usually with airstrikes. Now, it is irrelevant to ask who started. Right? In conflict, it doesn't matter who started. The conflict is ongoing for 100, of, 100 years. So this is kind of a cycle of retaliation and violence that has been going on. But on October 7th, something different happened. Uh, about 3,000 Hamas militants managed to um, cross the border at more than 11 places and entered Israel uh, territory, uh, reached even Ofakim. This is like a 25-minute drive. This is quite uh, into the Israel. And killed more than 1,100 um, civilians, Jewish Israeli civilians, in, mostly in the kibbutzes and moshavs here, but also in another place. There was also a big rave party. Maybe you heard about that. There was also a big... Uh, the electronic music festival uh, here, and um, uh, many were killed, uh, many Jewish Israelis were killed in the attack, about 400 from that party, but a total of 1,100. And also, as you know, uh, 240 civilians were kidnapped into the Gaza area, and their whereabouts are unknown. But also in retaliation or as a response, Israel started to attack the Gaza Strip and also uh, went inside. There was a land invasion inside of the Gaza Strip. And currently there are more than 12,000 Gazians dead from this war, uh, most of whom are civilians. So we are actually talking in terms of the number of casualties and the, the extreme violence and horrific attacks, these are unprecedented times. This is the worst episode in terms of escalation of conflict. And really, this is, this is very, uh, the situation is very, very dire. There's no need to paint it in any you know, rosy picture. And of course, civilians on both sides are suffering. But also there's a larger regional context. There are tensions in the north with, with Hezbollah, and also missiles are flying from Yemen into Israel territory. So there's also a larger escalation of violence in the region. And of course, I don't... All right. I don't know what happened. Maybe it's me. I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you about the ripple effects around the world, right? So we see the world divided now. You can be either pro-Israeli or pro-Palestine. You can't be, there's no shades in the middle. There's no complex 
or trying to understand the complexity of the problem. People take sides. You are expected to take a side. And this is, of course, very detrimental, not only to the people that are living in Europe, in the USA, but also back home, because that even makes the, both societies even more entrenched in their own self-righteousness, etc. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And all of this is happening while Israel's government, current government, is distrusted by most Israelis. I don't know if you heard about the protest movement for democracy that was happening eight months uh, before the attack. And about half the population of Israel joined these protest activities in response to all, so all sorts of anti-democratic um, uh, policies in, um, promoted by the Israeli government. So there's a government which is not trusted by most, most uh, Israelis, most uh, citizens, and suddenly that there, there is this event, and the military didn't respond well, the government didn't respond well, it actually has been dysfunctional since the beginning of, of these attacks, and the civil society in Israel re is replacing actually the government in all the initiatives to support the home front and the battle front. So everything is also inside of Israel. Israel is also divided and is, there is a political and domestic turmoil inside of Israel. So you can see how on all levels, regional and domestic and cross borders, there's a really, these times are very, very difficult um, in Israel and of course in the Palestinian territory. And I want to talk a little bit about the public sentiment. As a political psychologist, what interests me is how do people think? How do they feel? And what are the consequences of these beliefs and their feelings? And the first thing is that many people around the world, this is true in Israel and in the Palestinian territories, as and around the world, are bewildered by the, by the magnitude of these events. And so people are disoriented. And what do we do when we feel so bewildered and so amazed and so um, kind of lose our confidence? We tend to kind of adopt the, the closest thing we have, right? We need to make sense, so we kind of tend to cling to something that is simple. And the thing simple, very simple, is our identity, right? So we kind of adopt this simplistic understanding of the situation, a binary um, understanding of the situation. And the second thing that happens, as well as uh, you know very well, a phenomena called competitive victimhood. Each party is now kind of competing over who is more victimized. And the Israelis show their you know, the uh, photos of their loved ones, those who were killed and those who were kidna kidnapped, and Palestinians are showing the photos of civilians and children killed in the Gaza Strip. And the problem with this competition is that you cannot, if you're competing, you cannot acknowledge the other's pain and suffering, because then you lose points. Right? So if people are competing about who's more like more a victim, this is unconstructive and it doesn't, it, it's very hard to move forward uh, when there is this competition. The other thing that is happening is that there is the rally around the flag uh, phenomena. People are saying we are at war, we're going to leave our differences aside. And I could tell you that inside of Israel, there is an increase in radicalization, extreme nationalism, uh, increase in racism. Uh, increase in uh, racism against uh, Arab citizens of Israel due to these uh, tensions. And the last thing that happens is people lose hope. Now, as I'll show you, hope has actually two dimensions. The first dimension is the, the dimension that is uh, fueled by people's desires and dreams and aspirations. And the second dimension is our expectations, how much we believe these desires will come true. And when we talk about the hopes for peace or a conflict resolution in the region, we see that there is both perhaps an understandable decrease in the levels of expectations. People's belief in the possibility of peace, which was not high, is even lower now. 
but also the desires for peace, the aspirations and the dream of peace, we see this also declining. This is very natural, but of course very dangerous. And now I want to move to the book and ask you to do something. I want you to visualize hope. Like if you could draw it, if you could paint hope, how would it look like? And you know, for students in other places, you know, I, people, I ask people to take a pen and draw something. We won't do this now. But try to visualize hope. Many people, when I ask them to do uh, this assignment, they show their photos and they, uh, their drawings, and they are, there is like uh, sunrises and bright colors, and we associate hope with happiness and joy. But I want to show you a picture by George Watts, and this picture is called Hope. Can you see it back there? This picture is called Hope. It's not very happy, right? Let's see what we have. We, we have a female figure, and she's uh, sitting on a ball or a globe, which is almost drowning. Okay. She's almost drowning. And her eyes are covered, so there is a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability. She doesn't know how the future is going to turn out. And she's playing on this broken, shabby-looking old harp that has only one string. And this string is almost torn. It's a tiny string. And she's plucking the string and listening to the soft note that this broken-down string on this broken-down harp is and this is hope. And I, I'm going to argue that this is a very accurate portrayal of hope. Hope is not this shiny thing with bright colors. Hope is this small thing that you cling onto and you insist to cling onto when you are almost drowning, when you don't know the future when things look collapsing. And I'm actually going to talk, I think I'm, a, okay, I'll talk a little bit about, about the book's contribution and then we'll, we'll circle back to, uh, to the meaning of hope. So first of all, what I do in the book is I try to merge philosophical and psychological explorations of hope. So uh, philosophers talked about hope for many centuries. Psychologists started to explore hope as a psychological construct in the last decade, but there was no dialogue between philosophers and psychologists. And I try to merge these insights together. I also use a, a lot of methods. I'm, I'm a quant guy. Okay? I do quantitative studies. I do large-scale uh, surveys, statistical modeling, experiments. But I also did, a, I, there is a qualitative chapter in the book and there is also um, a text analysis that me and another student of mine did. So I'm trying to use all sorts of methods to un uh, understand what hope is. And I also explore it among both high power and low power groups. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is an asymmetrical conflict where Israel has the majority of, of, of uh, power militarily, economically, diplomatically, and, and so it makes sense that hope functions differently among the low power and the high power group. So I have studies in the uh, Palestinian territories and I have studies inside of Israel and I study hope in both societies. And the last thing is what I offer, I offer what's called the bi-dimensional model of hope. I'm going to present to you how to think about hope, both how to conceptualize it and also how I measure hope uh, in these circumstances. And so I'm going to start talking about the second chapter, which is about the merits of hope, but also hope's dangers. And I'm going to start with actually trying to persuade you that hope is something bad. 
that you should avoid hope as much as possible. All right? I'm trying to persuade you to think that hope is something negative, and it's not me. These are you know, smarter philosophers than, than myself talked about the downsides of hope, the dangers of hope. And the first one is Nietzsche. Nietzsche, he was a really happy guy. You know, he loved life so much. But one of the things he said is that hope is the worst of all evils. Why? Because it prolongs man's suffering. When we hope for something, when we long for something, it always comes with this pain, with this anxiety, right? We have something that we want and we always kind of pursue it and strive for it, but we never get there or get there only partially. And so hope always comes with some sort of anguish, some sort of, of pain. And of course, when we don't achieve our goal, it could devastate us. Right? So hope sometimes comes with pain and anguish. Uh, Spinoza and Descartes and others talked about hope as ignorance. Why is that? Because they said humans need to aspire for knowledge, certainty. We want facts. We don't want hope. We want to be certain. We want to know. So if men or humans need to aspire for knowledge, that's not hope. Hope is delusion, is basing your uh, decisions on what you want to happen, not necessarily realistic, okay? And so they promoted this idea that hope is, comes from ignorance, and it's foolish. And indeed, sometimes hope could make us pursue unrealistic goals. Hope could make us dismiss challenges. Hope could make us paint a rosy picture of reality when this is not uh, warranted. So this is another kind of, when hope becomes being naive, right? This is this trick. And thirdly, hope is very demanding. It's demanding in two ways, actually. In terms of hope as a mental construct, even the, like the neuropsychology of hope, hope is a very elaborate mental process. We need to think about the future, we need to think about an alternative future, we need to think about an alternative future that is good, we need to think how we plan to get there. That's it's quite demanding. Think about fear, think about anger, think about skepticism. That's easy in terms of the mental energy our brain needs. So being hopeful requires a lot of mental energy, really in terms of the neurons that work but also in terms of behavior. When we hope for something, we are expected to pursue it. Devote time, energy, effort. That's hard. We like to be lazy. Humans like to be lazy. And so people who are skeptical and, and pessimistic have it easy. Think about it. Is there a chance for uh, uh, justice? No, there's no chance, so I'm waiting and not doing anything about it. But if you hope for something and you are um, required and expected to pursue it, then you need to devote effort and time. All right, so I hope that everyone is convinced that hope is bad for you. And thanks so much for the time. But of course, the merits of hope not only overshadow the downsides. But many scholars and thinkers talked about hope as, a, as an existential human need, something that we could not do without. It's, not, it's like food and water and sleep. One of the people who talked about it was Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, I think most of you know the name, he was a Holocaust survivor. And he talked about meaning and hope in the dreadful circumstances of the concentration camps, of the Nazi uh, concentration camps. And he said that people who, that lost hope, Jews that were imprisoned in these camps and lost hope, they were the ones to perish. Those that had some hope, even the tiniest one, I don't know, that they will have some bread in the evening or something like that, 
had at least a possibility to survive. So he really connects hope with being alive and like something existential that we cannot live without. By the way, before he was caught uh, by the Nazis, he was a psychologist. He treated um, people with suicidal tendencies. These are times when people lose hope. Right? So he knew about hope also as a clinician, but also as, as someone who survived these, these dreadful circumstances. Lionel Tiger, he's an evolutionary psychologist. He talks about the fact that humans' overestimation of their success, so their overconfidence in their ability to succeed, is actually what made people advance. So, you know, people were sitting and, you know, in Africa with a canoe and said, yeah, I could cross this ocean, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. So they overestimate, they were a bit too confident. And maybe in the short run, they, were, they didn't succeed. But in the long run, everything that we see around us is actually hope driven. All the human advancement, technological advancement and social advancement is hope driven. This is because people desired a different future. They were thinking about a better future, well-being or technological and said, yeah, we want a different future, and yes, we could do it. Think about, I don't know, we don't have wings, right? We're not supposed to fly. We're not supposed to fly. But humans have looked to the stars and the moon and the clouds for centuries and said, I want, we want to be there. And through the generations and the centuries, they made it. So technological advancement, social advancement, democracy. What is democracy? People are saying, we want a different type of future and we could do it. And at first it didn't work. And also now we see it black sliding, right? But the fact that they desire it and believe that they could do it is what is actually, you know, this is the driver of these um, social advancements. And last, there are also um, studies that show that there are actually positive effects of being hopeful. Hopeful people have better achievements in uh, academic studies, in athletics. They actually live longer. Okay, there are studies that show that hopeful po uh, people have uh, live uh, more years. So hope is very advantageous. And what I tried to do in my book, and what I was going to try to do a little bit today, is talk about a type of hope that magnifies the merits of hope, kind of exploits all the positive things and the power and the great, kind of the great power of hope, but tries to avoid the negative sides. So it's important to know the downsides of hope so we won't fall into these traps and we use hope more constructively and more effectively. Okay, so we talked a little bit about you know, what's good and bad about hope, but we didn't talk about what hope is. And in fact, uh, psychologists, many psychologists are arguing about what hope is and I don't have to tell you when scholars argue they never there's no consensus, right? No one agrees about what hope is. Some psychologists uh, explore hope as a cognitive construct. Some explore it as an emotion. Some look at it as, as a motivational um, concept. So what I did is kind of went back to the basics. And I looked in popular dictionaries in all sorts of languages. And what I found was that the definition in these popular languages, in, all, in, in these popular dictionaries, in all sorts of languages, was always quite straightforward and identical. What is hope? It's a desire accompanied by an expectation of fulfillment. So we already know or see that there are actually two components here. The four, first is a desire. And of course, in order to hope for something, I need to want it. I'm not, we don't hope for things that we are indifferent to or certainly that we don't want. So some desire and an expectation, some belief, even the smallest one, that 
this uh, desire could be fulfilled. Very basic, very straightforward. And indeed, afterwards, when I looked at all the scholarship of hope scholars, I found hidden in their own definitions these two components. And what I try to promote in this book is that wishes and expectations, these two dimensions, are actually sufficient and necessary components of hope. So we need, we must have these two, right? And there, we don't need anything else, actually. And I'll give you an example. The first one is a wish to attain a goal. This is the motivational dimension. And the second is the expectation. And we can't do just with one. So for example, if I may, I want to share something personal. Uh, I always wanted to be an astronaut. Since the age of three, I've uh, looked in these uh, books with uh, spaceships and stars and planets. I always wanted to be an astronaut, and I still do. I want to be honest with you. But given the fact that I'm a scholar in the Hebrew University, and the fact that I also am afraid of flights, uh, I don't think NASA will now take me to their uh, programs. Okay? So even though my wish is very high, because my expectations are zero, that nullifies my hope. I can't say I hope to be an astronaut. Maybe I wish, but I don't hope because I don't have any expectations. There's no chance. Uh, maybe if I get used to flying, maybe. But um, I can't say I hope because the expectation is zero, so that nullifies my hope. But what happens, for example, if I park in a no parking zone? So I see a person giving uh, parking tickets. So I might expect to get a parking ticket, but I certainly don't hope to get a parking ticket because my wishes are zero. That's not something that I desire or wish. So when I expect something and I don't have wishes, also that nullifies my hope. Okay, so these two components are necessary and, and what I also argue are sufficient to um, elicit hope. Problem is that the word itself is very confusing in, very, in many languages. So I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine said to me many years ago, I really, really hope that there will be peace between Israelis and Palestinians, but I have no hope that there will be peace. But you just said you have a lot of hope. How can you have no hope? Because in the first part of the sentence, she was um, talking about her wishes and desires. I really, really hope that there will be peace, meaning I desire, aspire, right? This is my dream. But I don't have hope, meaning I think there's no chance. My expectations are very low. So in many languages, sometimes we use the word hope to signify our wishes, sometimes our expectations, and sometimes, and most of the time, some unknown c combination of these two elements. So it's very hard to actually measure hope and study hope if you don't know what people are talking about, if people if use it in, in different ways. And indeed, this confusion really affected scholarly studies of hope, because you didn't know if people were um, reporting their desire, their expectations, or something in the middle. So what I propose to do is look at hope not as a unidimensional construct that is comprised of these two components and we could either be low or high on, but as a bidimensional construct that is actually, it's a plane, it's a bidimensional plane. One dimension is the wish dimension. And the higher I'm on that dimension, it means the more I want something, desire, aspire for something. And the second dimension is how much I believe it could come true. How much I believe in the chances. And so the, the, when you move from this area to the darker shades, your hope increases. All right? So here you are indifferent and think that something is impossible. And the more you move here, the higher the thing is, it, you desire it more and think it is possible, feasible. By the way, here there's no hope because this is certainty. When we know something is going to happen, hope is irrelevant. The most interesting part is this part. 
is when we greatly desire something, we want something so badly, but we don't believe this is possible. Or we believe that the chances are very low. And this is, for example, true, think about people ha who have severe illness. Right? The more people, the more their illness is severe and acute, the more they desire to recover, but sometimes the chances are getting slimmer, right? Are decreasing. And this is also true during conflict. People desire a resolution. They want this, this really bleak situation, the, the casualties and the violence to stop. But they think that the chances to do that are very, very low. So I find this the most interesting place to study, this corner of hope. Okay, a few more points. How much time do I have? No, but seven minutes to six. Okay, so we'll continue for I'll continue for about ten minutes, and then we'll do the Q and A. Okay, so a few more points. What happens when one dimension biases the other? So we know, for example, from um, studies that use this bidimensional model, and I started this, but many other scholars use this bidimensional model. We know that the correlation between these two dimensions is usually uh, between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. And those of you that do know a little bit quantitative uh, methods know that this is, and the and, um, correlation is significant. So there is a connection between wishes and expectations, but it's not very strict. There is a, each, each dimension is also independent. What happens when these two dimensions are too close to each other and influence each other? The first thing we might have is wishful thinking. What is wishful thinking? Is when the fact that we want something so badly makes us overestimate our chances for success. We kind of say, yeah, of course we could do it, right? But it's not because we made a true assessment of the situation, it's just because we want it so badly. This is wishful thinking. And that's a problem for people that are engaged in social change. Because we want our wishes to stay high, but we don't want, we want to assess reality as it is. We want to be very clear, you know, not dismiss any challenge, know exactly what the reality is, what the obstacles is, right? Not to paint the, the, the reality in rosy pictures. But the second problem is that when our when low expectations decrease our wishes. This is when the obstacles are so high, we stop desiring something. We stop wanting and wishing, we stop having a dream. And this is also detrimental to, for people who are engaged in social change. Because the challenges are going to come. They are actually in front of us all the time. And they might increase even. And if these challenges decrease our desires and wishes and aspirations, that's a problem. We want them to keep going on even when the chances for success are not high. And another important aspect of hope is the fact that hope is always action-oriented. So some people ask, could we be hope and passive about it? Is there such thing as passive hope? Yeah, I hope for something. So again, scholars and thinkers much smarter than myself dismiss this notion of passive hope. There is no such thing as passive hope. If you are hoping for something and you're not doing anything about it, that's not hope. That's something else. Some people call it optimism. Some people call it different things. That's not hope. What is hope? Hope is always action-oriented, is always tied to some behavioral output, to some action. Okay? And this is, of course, very relevant to people that are engaged in, in, in social change. And um, President Mason said, bef but, uh, when she talked, she said, one of the things that we know is that when people protest or demonstrate, they have hope. But I, will, I would also want to look at it from the other uh, 
side. Reverse the pattern. When we are engaged in activism, when we are pursuing this hope, we are actually replenishing our own hope. Any one of you who have been active in some sort of initiative, social initiative or political initiative, knows that when people gather and they work for something, suddenly they feel hope. Why do they feel hope? Not necessarily because they estimate the chances now are higher, but just because their vision or their dream suddenly becomes more concrete. So it works, hope works on both directions. Hope generates activism, and activism generates hope. Okay. Uh, we said we have um, five minutes. So let me kind of um, talk about two things. First of all, I'll talk about the Hope Map Project. The Hope Map Project is is a way for me to take this bi-dimensional model and actually use it to measure hope in times of conflict. And so, so far, more than 4,800 participants, Jewish Israelis, Palestinians from the Palestinian territories, and Cypriots, both from the north of the island, where there is a Turkish uh, majority, and from the south of the island, where is a Greek majority, participated in these studies. Uh, data was collected at far, four time points, and again, from these two conflict zones, Israel-Palestine and north and uh, south of Cyprus. And altogether, this is the most comprehensive data set on, on hope for peace, and people that are engaged in quantitative analysis could uh, obtain this data set or contact me, and we could work on project from this data set. And there were three goals of this project. First is to assess the levels of hope for peace in these conflict zones. And when I say level, uh, assess the levels, meaning assess the desires, right, the wishes, and the expectations for peace. And I could compare between societies, I could compare between conflicts, I co could compare across time. The second goal was to see if we could identify any determinants of hope. So these are demographic or other social political variables that predict people's hope for peace. Are the older more hopeful than the young? Are the secular less or more hopeful than the religious? We could test these in models. And the third thing is to see whether their hope actually matters. So could we identify a connection between hope and, for example, policy preference. Maybe there's no connection between these two things, right? So we could measure these and test these. And what I'm going to kind of talk about is findings from stud a study that I did in 2019. This was the first, the last time that I measured hope for peace in, among Israelis and Palestinians simultaneously at the same time. I have. Uh, kind of more recent data, but this is not simultaneous data. Hope for reciprocal peace. What is reciprocal peace? This is when I asked Israelis and Palestinians that participated in my study, how much do you wish and expect uh, some sort of a settlement or a um, peace accord that respects and addresses the needs of your people and the needs of the rival side. How much do you want this kind of peace that addresses the needs of your people and the, and the adversary? And how much do you think this is achievable? And these are the results. So you're going to see, these are Jewish Israelis um, hope for peace. These are 500 people, this is a representative sample. Representative sample means that what you see here actually reflects the general society of Jewish Israelis in Israel. This is, again, this is 2019, so it's not that um, up to date. But we certainly see that most of the observations are here in this uh, left upper corner. So most of the Jewish Israelis desire this kind of peace but think it is impossible or there's little chance. You see here that there are also people who don't want this. So yes, there are some people who say, no, this is not desirable, this kind of solution. 
and some people who also think that this is possible, but not a lot. Again, most of the people are here. Now these are results from the Palestinian society. Again, 500 people, West Bank and Gaza Strip. Again, most of the observations are still here. Most of the Palestinians desire this, but think it is impossible. There are also more people that don't desire, but also more people that think it is possible. The interesting thing is that when I compare the means on the desire dimension, it's identical. So the desire for some sort of solution that will address the needs of both people is high and identical in both societies. And I see it also in the data that I collect more recently. But the expectations, actually when you compare the expectations, you see that Palestinians' belief in the possibility of peace is higher. And if we'll have time, we'll talk about it. So I'm going to jump, there are also other interesting, okay. I'm just going to talk about whether hope matters. And what we did here is asked, and I'm going to show you results aggregated across all conflicts, across all the data. So this is more than 4,800 people that participated across conflicts and societies. We asked them a bunch of questions that relate to their policy preference. How much do they support all sorts of initiatives uh, for peace? How much they support dialogue groups? How much they support international involvement for uh, conflict resolution? How much they support uh, making concessions and compromises in, a, in a negotiations? All sorts of more policy-oriented ideas. And that, that was our outcome. And then what we can do in the model, in a regression model, a statistical model, we could put all sorts of elements and factors on one side of the equation and see if they affect this outcome. So we could see whether hope matters, whether political ideology matters, whether, whether religiosity matters, right? And how much that affects people's or um, predicts people's uh, policy preference. And here are the results. And what we see here is that people's desires for peace is the most robust predictor of these policy preferences of Israelis, Palestinians, Turkish Cypriots, and Greek Cypriots uh, support for all sorts of peace-promoting policies. And the expectation dimension also is very, very, you know, it's a, it's a strong predictor. Okay, and there are other here that are also predict, but their influence is less. What does that mean? That means that, you know, for this question, does hope matter? It matters very much. In many ways, these are, you know, two of the most robust predictors of people's willingness to compromise, to support international intervention, all of that. So hope matters very much. But another thing you see here is that the wish dimension is a stronger predictor. And that kind of made me think in the conclusion chapter, I ask, which dimension is more important? What's more important, to want something or believe you can achieve it? That's an important question for social change. What's more important? So first of all, most empirical evidence that I collected showed that the wish dimension is, is more important. But also, I really rely on one of the great, I don't know, politicians, I think, and this is Václav Havel. Václav Havel was a Czechoslovakian playwright in the 60s. And when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia, he found himself as the leader of the opposition of, to free Czechoslovakia from the Soviet uh, rule and, and, and Soviet invention and he, uh, invasion, and he was in the in the, the pri in prison, and he kind of the, he was the leader of the opposition, and he wrote about hope, and he said our hope was very strong, but it was not motivated by our belief that we could actually kick the Soviets out. We didn't know if we can do it. It was driven 
by our uncompromising wishes and desires and aspiration for a free Czechoslovakia. So he says that the wish dimension matters more. What matters more is how much you desire something and how much you aspire for it. Thinking that you can do it is also important, but not as much. And lastly, we also talked with one of the chapters uh, is written by one of my students, Shani Talmo, who interviewed Israeli and Palestinian peace activists. And we try to see what is, when they talk about hope, what do they talk about? And we noticed that their expectations for peace is not necessarily high, not higher than other people, right? So you saw also that Israelis and Palestinians, they don't really believe in the possibility of peace, and so do peace activists. That's a little bit strange, right? They are, but they say, listen, we don't know if it's possible. We don't know. But our desires are so unshakable, we are so certain in the need, in the importance for peace in the Middle East. This is our hope, this is our driver of hope, the wish dimension, the desires, the aspirations, the dreams. If it were only, if our hope were, was only kind of associated with our expectations, mm, we're not sure we'll be as, as active. And so, to end this um, talk, I want to talk about optimal hope. Optimal hope is this kind of hope that magnifies the merits of hope and decreases the disadvantages. And what I found is that optimal hope is this kind of hope that is, relies more on the desires and wishes. It's not that expectations don't matter, but we need to put our weight more on our desires. And this hope is more sustainable. Why? Because it's durable in the face of obstacles. If our hopes are driven by our desires and dreams, then even when there are obstacles and challenges, we continue, right? Secondly, they are less naive because we don't need to paint a rosy picture of reality in order to hope. If our hope is only relying on the expectation dimension, then you know, we need to kind of dismiss the challenges. But hope that relies on our desires and aspirations is less naive. And the third part of optimal hope is the fact that it has to be active. It has to be active. And we said, hope generates action, but action then circles back and generates hope. And if we go back to the tragic reality now, I want to say that during these Tragic times. Jewish-Arab partnership in Israel is, has a strong voice, certainly to help Bedouin communities in the South. Bedouin, which are Muslim Arabs, were hit harshly by the attacks. 25 of them were killed in, you know, by, in gun gunpoint, at gunpoint when the Hamas militants knew that they were Muslims and Arabs, they killed them, 25, much more when their missiles are flying on their villages. And so the Bedouin community, which is an Arab Muslim community, was hit hard, and then Jewish and Arab Israelis are working together to help these communities. In these dire circumstances, you see suddenly these activities of, of hope. And there are also four members of the Bedouin community now um, held hostage in Gaza. So it's not only Jewish Israel, it's also four Bedouins are held by Hamas. And other people, some of them from that region, are talking about peace. Inon Maoz, is, uh, he lost his uh, mom and dad in the attack. They were killed on the 7th of October. And I heard him speak some days ago, before I came here. So I live in Tel Aviv and I'm just here for a visit. And he talks about the necessity of resolution and peace. So this person that suffered so much from this, from the, the escalation of conflict, 
talks about peace. So these are signs of hope in the midst of these tragic events. And thank you so much. And you could scan this, and there is more information. This is to my website, and there's more information uh, about my work. Thanks so much. Did I go over time? No? Good? Okay. Thank you so much, Oded, for the clarity of the book and the talk and, and the courage of uh, facing these issues. We're going to pretend for a minute that I'm Steve. Uh, Carol introduced me as Professor Russell, but for the purposes of this evening, you can call me Steve. We're going to pretend for a minute that we're in the classroom, and I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor to introduce yourself, to say hi, and to ask if there is one thing that was said today that resonated with you, that you felt like you agreed with, that you felt like, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And also, if there is one thing that was new, that you are not sure about, that you have a question about, or that you disagree with strongly. So I'll give you a minute. Just turn to your neighbor, say hi, one thing you agree with, and one, one question that you have. Okay, everybody's had a chance to go. Bo both people got to talk, or you still need some more time? All right, I think, I think both. I can go, you can continue. <laughs> All right, so we have a, some time for questions. I'm going to hold on to the mic, and I'll sort of try to come around. And um, we'll, we'll start with Professor Grant, and then we'll, we'll sort of try to make our way around. First, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, when you talk about hope, I'm, I'm wondering if it's, there's a mediated, mediating variable between uh, expectation and desire, and, and that being the victim narrative that you started off by discussing. So if you have a need for a victim narrative, either side of a conflict, then even if you had the hope, you wouldn't, wouldn't have the expectation. Am I making sense? It, it, just as particularly in this conflict, there seems to be a need for that victim narrative on both sides in different ways, so that's why I brought it up. Yeah, I, I will say I will say I completely agree, right? So, first of all, really, this is important to say. Okay, the situation now back home is bad. Okay, don't we don't need to sugarcoat it. Uh, I talked to my uh, my family three hours ago. They were in the shelter room in uh, in Tel Aviv, and uh, just a week ago I was with them. And right now, I'm, I'm, uh, and when you in the shelter room, you hear the explosions easily. You hear it. You most uh, most of the time it's intercepted in midair, and you hear the explosion in the midair. Okay. And the situation in the Gaza Strip is horrible, horrible. And so, yes, the, the pain of the two sides are real, okay? And they are now, you know, and, you know, you could argue again, but the, the argument who is a more victim is unproductive, really. When you are in a position of a victim, you kind of disempower yourself. You say, I have no power. I'm the victim. I have no leverage. I have no, um, you know, apart from saying I'm a victim again and again and showing how, you know, the, the intensity of, of my pain, um, it, I think it's disempowering. And the trick is, and that's a very difficult trick, is to understand that yes, you are in pain now, in real pain. But find some way to be empowered by that. And the, the issue with agency, so agency is connected to hope very strongly. Right? 
when we believe that we have nothing to do, and usually when we're in the victims, we say, we are, have nothing to do with it. You know, we're passive here, right? So that is very detrimental. I have been, I volunteered for um, about a week in the headquarters of the um, hostages, the families of the hostages. This is not the government initiative, this is the family of the hostages. And I saw their people that inspired me. Now they are now, their loved ones are in, in captivity somewhere. But they were so, and, but they kind of adopted an empowering or empowered um, stance towards this. And for me, these are the people that uh, inspire me. And when we look at history, we see people that came from marginalized groups and groups that were you know, victimized or uh, historically marginalized, but they didn't take this victimhood and, and like made it the whole, you know, everything. No, they said, yes, we come from a disadvantaged point of view, but we are now empowering ourselves and others. So I hope that answers some of your question, uh, at least. Uh, we'll we'll yes. go to the gentleman who was second. I'll just hold on to the mic. I'll, I'll also say that I'm going to stay around yeah, after, so there are, if there are questions, so no. I, oh, sorry. Yeah, you get it. I'm Joshua. Uh, Hi. I like to, can I ask you like two questions? Please. Okay, so um, from a standpoint, I want to ask you this. Do you think that hope can be crushed from the government playing politics with people? And if people can put their foot in other people's shoes and their point of view, do you think that that will gain hope? Okay, so if I understand correctly, first you were talking if, if uh, governments could uh, elicit hope, you, again? I'm saying that, yeah. I'm saying this, that if it's possible that a government could crush somebody's hope. Crush? I, yeah, crush. Oh, yes. Definitely so. So I, I, another chapter in this book, it, most of the, the, the research that I do is the research on public opinion. So I do large-scale surveys and, you know, I, I, I'm interested in the masses. But I was also very interested in elite politics. And I asked one of my students, Ilana, would you want to lead a project on hope among the leadership. And in this project, we noticed that some leaders are leaders that use the politics of hope. They encourage their people and their, the citizens to believe in a brighter future and believe in their chances to achieve it. But some politicians use the politics of skepticism they discourage people to believe that there is a brighter future. And in many ways it helps them because it keeps people in survival mode, right? And decreases their um, expectation that the government will, uh, will indeed uh, improve their situation. So we notice that, and this is a great question, yes, some, First of all, some governments do and leaders crush hope, and some of them use this as a political tool. Okay, that's a word, the first thing. And the second question was? Raise your voice and we'll hear it. Okay. The second question is, if, if a people like, you know, see you somebody in their point of view, right? Mm. Like Empathy. Empathy, yeah. Empathy. Yeah, that's a great point. So, uh, I have a good uh, colleague of mine, Yossi Hasson. He's an uh, expert on empathy. I do hope, right? I like I'm, a, I'm the hope guy and he's the empathy guy. And in our joint studies, we see that there is a correlation between these two. So, uh, the ability to be empathetic to others' pain and others' condition and put ones in others' shoes is related to hope. Uh, but again, the correlation is not very high. So they are both independent constructs. So there's also some difference between them. I hope I answered this. I think there was a hand here earlier. <laughs> Hi, I'm Claudia Kallerman. I'm the chair of the art and music department here. I wanted you to ask you, uh, what kind of hope could you tell our students to have when they're hearing from their peers uh, this idea that 
uh, from the river to the sea so that their peers want the extermination of the Jewish people. So what can you say to our students? Uh, wow. So um, you know, there could be there are voices, there are voices who call for extermination or expelling or kicking out. You know, very very negative um, futures, an exclusive future. So this is all ours and not yours, and you need to. Be uh, get out or get, get killed, etc. And we have these voices also in Israel. Okay, and these voices are so detrimental to the societies, their own societies. Right. So I have for this, of course, for this kind of thing, I have I have nothing to say, of course. Right. Any uh, call for complete destruction of the other society. It's something that is, you know, it even doesn't generate hope for one's own society. Because this is a portrayal of a future that is filled with blood and, 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 and uh, death. This is not, there's nothing hopeful about that in, in any way. So, you know, this is perhaps a partial answer, right? Uh, but I also hear these, these things, and these themes also I hear it in my society. Okay, so and this is something that we need to. If there is some, if there is something we need to struggle against, is this exclusive understanding of who's who's going to be between the river and the sea, right? And you know, from my understanding, and also you saw from my data, most of the Israelis and Palestinians not only are okay with, but their desires. What their, the, their vision at the end is some sort of coexistence, some sort. The, the exact um, you know, configuration is less important. But the fact that the two peoples live there, are going to stay there, is something that people not only need to understand at the top, but to desire. Right? And so, if there is anything we need to struggle against and we to fight against is these exclusive calls. Oh, um, so first of all, thank you for coming out. It's Thanks nice so much. having you at our school. Uh, my question is about, um, first of all, like it, it's, it's not that known of a fact, but a lot of the people who uh, infiltrated on October 7th were people who had permits to work in Israel. Also, you mentioned that like over the years, there are like two times a year where there'll just be like an influx of like rocket launches. Do you think that Israel giving those permits and do you think that Israel um, maybe not doing a ground invasion sooner after those barrages of rockets coming in was hope or wishful thinking? And also, um, maybe you can clarify a little bit about um, how you how you said that like hope is action oriented when like you mentioned also like it's hope that occurs in like the most dire of situations where people really have no ability to make much action how do those two things align okay great so um, I'll try to answer the first two questions that talk about it's like more policy oriented uh, questions um, but they are related to hope Okay. One of the things that happened, you know, and I've been I've been around for a while. Okay, so I've been um, in my twenties during the Oslo days. The Oslo Accords were the um, perhaps the, the the most significant advancements toward Israeli-Palestinian peace in the history of the conflict, right? And this was kind of early 90s uh, until mid 90s, about until uh, the assassination of uh, Rabin, the Prime Minister, who, the Israeli Prime Minister, who advanced advanced these talks. And during these times, in both society, there was some kind of hope. What does that mean? People, we said that hope is something existential, right? So people need this idea that, yes, the future could be better, 
right? And these were the, the times of hope. But in the last 15 years, the uh, policies of the Israeli government crushed hope both among, for peace both among Israelis and Palestinians. So you see the desperation is so strong in both societies. Many times these desperations lead to these, these uh, you know, atrocities or, or these horrific, you know, people are desperate to the, to, to the point of, of they don't care, right? Violence for the sake of violence, not to achieve something, but violence for the sake of violence, to hurt the other, to revenge, etc. right? This is what we're seeing. So, about the permits, I cannot tell you, but I'm sure that leaving, you know, uh, Palestinians so desperate, crushing moderate voices from, from, from Palestine is not something that is, you know, was, be was uh, beneficial. And about the ground invasion, I don't know, okay? I am not, I don't study military actions, etc. I'm always in, I will try to be always on the side of, you know, trying to promote any, the resolve of any disagreements by talk, but not, not by force. But, the second, but uh, I will refer to your, uh, the second part of your question. So how could hope be active when people are in such a, in such a dark situation? And for me, you know, we talked about how hope becomes relevant. For me, you see, actually, people engaging in activity in these dark moments. When I passed here, I saw uh, the pictures and the exhibition from 9-11. This was a horrible attack here in this city, right? Tell me if I'm right. Did people's most courageous and humane character, did it not emerge in these circumstances? Did not people go and help people, uh, evacuate people from trouble, help each other, stand soldier to soldier in it? This is exactly this. This is, the, this is hope. Currently in Israel, something quite crazy happened. I've talked about the movement for democracy, right? So about half of the population was engaged before the, the, the attack, was engaged in these activities and protests and all sorts of groups and everything that, to promote democracy in Israel. On the night of Saturday, so when the news started to come in about the horrible attack, all the leaders of these movements and all the people, they understood that now they need to take all of the networking, all the apparatus, all the infrastructure the resource and take this instead of, you know, doing the demonstration for democracy, um, take these, these resources and put them to the effort to support the home front and the battlefront. And so, the day after, like on that day, we all, in, do you use WhatsApp? Okay, we use WhatsApp all the time. Okay, I have, I'm, a, I'm a, a part of maybe 150 WhatsApp groups. Okay, groups of the parents of the kids of this, uh, of my son's uh, class group, okay. But also in the demonstration, in the uh, movement for democracy, we were a part of hundreds of groups. And suddenly, the, for example, one of the groups switched its kind of logo and goal and said, okay, we are now, uh, who is available to drive, to take down from the outskirts of the Gaza Strip, not really close, not in the battlefield, but just about, people that are stranded there, that are stuck, elderly or other people. You know how many, so I, I am part of this. I, I, on Saturday, Sunday morning, I drove to the vicinity of Beersheba and took two people from that to, to safety. I'm not one. We were about 15,000 civilians driving, you know, because the government was so dysfunctional, didn't do anything. There was no public transportation, nothing. For three weeks, you know, Israel recruited 350,000 uh, reserve soldiers but they, they couldn't feed them. Who fed them? That's the civil society. 
This is the action in these dark moments. This is where you see people's most courageous stance, soli social solidarity. You know what it also does? Because I've participated, or I, like I went with my kids to, um, um, to pack food. Okay, just, you know, me and another, you know, many tens of thousands of people. Suddenly you feel hope. Why do you feel hope? Not necessarily because you think that, you know, now the chances, not because of the expectation dimension. Nothing really changed. People understand that the, the, the situation is still bad. Why? Because suddenly you say, yeah, that's a society I want to live in. People shoulder to shoulder, working, devoting their time and energy. They don't care about money, no, nothing. Just volunteering. When you volunteer, doesn't it make you more hopeful? Right? Kind of fills you. Okay? So I think we that. have time just for one last question. Which will go over here. I'll, I'll just keep, I'll just hold oh, it. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as an American Jew, I'm deeply, deeply concerned and involved. But I want to ask a question about the situation that was resolved, how you would apply in, in Ireland, how you would apply your theories and what you've learned. Explain to us how it happened in Ireland that they resolved this, the troubles, this terrible, terrible situation. Right. So th thanks for this uh, wonderful question. And many times people refer to the conflict in Northern Ireland, right? Also an intractable conflict that has a ethical and religious aspects to it, nationalistic as aspect to it, similar to, to the conditions in Israel-Palestine, a little bit different, but some, some similarities. One of the things we know from the conflict there is that two things happened. It was a bottom-up process with a lot of pressure from the international uh, community on leaders, you know, the, uh, um, on, on both Protestant and, and uh, Catholic leaders. But a very, very strong bottom-up movement and this might be, if we're talking about hope, this might be actually what we're talking about. Anything that we think is going to happen in Israel, Palestine, is not going to happen if we sit and wait for it to happen and wait for the leadership to do something about it. The call and the promotion and advancement of any resolution, again, I'm, you know, it doesn't really matter for, the, for at this time, uh, this moment in time, will happen if people engage in very deliberate call, strong, and pressure both uh, sides to promote some sort of resolution. Right? So, and I want to say just, uh, add maybe a final note. You know, we're talking about peace, we're talking about all, but we are in war now. And we are a bit like in a car crash while it is crashing. So when, you, when the car is crashing, it's hard to think about the future. You know, this happens when we, the car finished to crash and then we're out and then we see, okay, we wounded here, we're going to mend our, you know, we need to tend, have broken ribs, okay, I need to do something about it. But when the car is crashing, it's hard to know what to do. One of the things that I encourage all of us to do, including myself, is, you know, when the car crashes, you a bit brace yourself, right? You, you protect yourself. I would encourage people, when I say protect in this sense, is not to jump to conclusions, not to adopt extreme points of view, right? Stay, not calm, but stay focused, right? Remember values you believe in. Okay, and let them lead you, because people are now, like, opinions are, and, you know, are all over now. And that makes sense. But this is what I would encourage people to, to do. Yep. Thank you so much. I, I did say that was going to be the last question, but I see a student who wants to ask a question. It's hard for me as a professor not to give a student a chance. So this will be the last question. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming to speak. On behalf of, like, a lot of the students sitting in the room, um, we wanted to ask that we're speaking a lot about hope and kind of like the up-down versus top-down like top model and finding hope and looking for hope. 
And we think that on campus, it's really hard. Like, we talk a lot about it, but the narratives in the classroom don't represent all the opinion and don't leave room for the conversations to happen. The student council doesn't represent the whole student body. And the climate on campus is very polarized. And even this event, which in my opinion, wasn't pro one side or the other, wasn't advertised the way all the other speakers that are coming this month was advertised. It wasn't on the school's social media pages. It wasn't in the hallways like other events. And so how do you, like, what would you suggest to the students? Um, how do we, like, maintain the hope even, like, after, like, feeling like nothing's changing, nothing's happening? Yeah, so, so thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. And I, and, I, and I relate to what you're saying. And I want to also, to also congratulate you for the courage and, and you know, for, for saying that. So, so this is very important. Um, what can I say? Maybe, maybe the answer that I could give you, maybe, Okay, and, and, and again, I understand that there are now, there are, the tensions our campus are real, it's uncomfortable, it's not, people are not at, you know, should feel safe, people are not feeling safe, you know, people are, there's tension, and I, and I, and I understand this. Um, again, what I think, you know, in, so back home, for example, there's always also this tension, right? And this tension is on, on many levels. And what I would kind of encourage you to do, so first of all, you know, you could certainly speak with faculty and, and, and staff. Again, they are, here, they are here. I can't speak for them, for them you know, and, um, um, and speak and raise these, these uh, concerns for sure. But still keep kind of your values, like stick to them. Do not fall in the trap of extremism. Do not fall in the trap of just retaliating or just do not fall in these traps. This is a trap, okay? Stay connected to your values, stay connected to who you are, don't be ashamed of it, but also don't you know, use it as a tool. Right? And this is what I would, I don't know if it's helpful, and we could chat afterwards, by the way, I don't mind staying a bit and, and thinking with you guys or, or any, anyone here, really, um, about, about this. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, first, I, I do want to just correct one thing. These were all over the place. <laughs> If I have them, and they're they're downstairs in the hallways and stuff too, are they everywhere? Okay. So. Yeah. All right. So hold on. I want to. I don't want to debate this. I just wanted to say that we were not trying to hide it. We were trying as much as we could to publicize it. I will tell you, this crowd we have here is representative of of the fact that I've never seen this many people in a room for something we've had here on campus in recent months. So I want to congratulate you all for showing up, because this. This kind of audience for this is huge. And I know that you're not in the same space as I'm in to see the lower crowds, but this is really good turnout. And I want you to know that this it was important to have this conversation. And I am so grateful that you came to lead us through this and to give us a framework for thinking about things differently. Um, the book, um, I hope that you all get it. I hope you. Uh, some of the professors here I know are going to now think about it. We'll try to figure out how to. Your library is supposed to be. Yeah. Oh, no, no. We... Don't buy it. No, no, no. I was going to say, no, here's, well, here's what I was going to say, and I was looking at you because I was like copyright infringement. Um, if they do chapters, they might get some copies. <laughs> so so we, we have copies here, and we've bought them, and we will continue to buy them. 
Um, but I thank you, Oded, for the framework of thinking about what hope is and putting it in a context that, that I will change my language now as a result of this. And I really want to say thank you to the students who showed up today. Because coming in here and wanting to learn about this, um, when he talked about, uh, about you know, not seeing ourselves as victims of thinking about what you can do, your presence here demonstrates your hopefulness, your commitment, your activism, because you showed up to learn. And that's what we're here to do at John Jay, is to learn and to grow, all of us, including the professors. You've got several of them in here. And so I want to say thank you to the professors and staff folks who showed up as well, other members of our community, because um, this is how we're going to move through this. This is how we're going to move through to a hopeful, more hopeful future, is if we make the opportunity to learn and engage with each other. And look at this room. This is a diverse room. I mean, really, I want you to take a, take a look around and see who's in here. It's not a monolithic group. It's a diverse group that is committed to learning and engaging with each other. And that's what we do best at John Jay. What we do best at John Jay is putting yourselves in a room where you're uncomfortable. We don't want you to be uncomfortable. The reality is, is that's how we're going to grow and develop that muscle is by putting yourself in spaces where you're un uncomfortable, safe, but uncomfortable, and pushing. And that's what you guys do on a regular basis. And I just want to say thank you again. But when you when you feel the despair, because you're going to, you're going to, and this is hard. I'm not even going to pretend that I understand what you're going through right now. But when you're in those moments where it feels really tough and hard, visualize this room again and see the people that showed up who want to grow, who want to figure out how do we move through this in a positive way. So thank you all again. This won't be the last conversation we have about these things. But I hope we can get you back again later. Thank you.